buyer of bill of lading based upon the carrier issuance of the bill of lading. We shall examine these issues, discuss them with our esteemed panelists. I mean, before we start, uh, we always go back to a little bit of history of bill of lading. As we all know that bill of lading started way back invented in 13th century. It comes into the common use of in 16th century, mostly reciting with the sub packages. The first copy of the bill was written in way back in 1564. In early days of uh, trading, uh, as we all know that most of the ship owners were the one issuing the bill of lading and they, they had a strong bargaining power to take advantage of the contract. There have been numerous cases of liabilities of the shippers and the carriers over the years, recognizing the course confusion over liability, various legislation enacted over the year. Namely, Higwisby rule and Hanger rule, which are still in practice, usually expressly incorporated as a clause per amount in the reverse side of the bill of lading. Let's open the floor and invite our panelists to give their ideas and overview of their understanding of the issues associated with the bill of lading. I would like to start off with uh, 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 Liz uh, says online. Welcome, Liz. And uh, 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 what's your view on uh, understanding of the issues which are associated with the bill and letter of indemnities? Hi, thanks very much, Sanjeev. Um, I think from where I sit, as certainly as a litigation lawyer, you know, I sit on the enforcement side um, and things often go wrong where bills of lading and letters of indemnity are concerned. Um, I think it's a good starting point to, to, to make the point that LOIs are by definition an indemnity for a claim. It's a letter of indemnity. So it, it's in a way a representation by someone in the contractual chain. They're saying that we're asking you to do something that you don't have to do. Uh, and in return for that, for doing it, then we'll indemnify you if it all goes wrong. So by the very nature, LOIs presuppose that there could potentially be a claim. And in that sense, they're intended to be, uh, in many circumstances, uh, Maria will, will, I'm sure, talk more about this, a, a replacement for your insurance cover, for your P&I cover. Um, from my perspective, if you, if you take nothing else away, then I think my most important point to highlight would be counterparty risk or LOI counterparty insolvency. So I think that there's nothing magic about an LOI. It's, it's nothing more than a contract. It's an agreement between two entities in a charter party chain. So a ship owner um, or anyone else's ability to enforce that LOI contract when things go wrong very, very much depends on the financial standing of the person who's given the LOI. So you need to need to look very carefully at who's given it to you if you're going to accept an LOI. Who are they? Uh, do they have any assets? Um, and importantly, have you done any due diligence on them? Every claims as an example, which we'll look at later on in the webinar. You know, the quantum of a misdelivery claim against a ship owner can be for the full value of the cargo. So, so that can be many millions of dollars and, and that sort of a claim is arguably um, not going to be subject to, to package limitation. So I think that would be my, my biggest takeaway at the outset. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, uh, that's wonderful. And um, yeah, uh, move across uh, with Maria. Uh, Maria, I'll just come back to you. And uh, what's your understanding with the issues, uh, which is, again, uh, related to the BL and LOIs? Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, so I would like to clarify a little bit, perhaps uh, the role of P&I clubs um, have in the situations where LOIs are used. Um, I find that perhaps there is uh, commonly some misunderstanding or a misconception uh, as to what your P&I club can or cannot do in these situations, and also whether there is any cover in place if something goes wrong. Um, now, people uh, seem to think that because you're using LOIs, you're prejudicing your p and cover. But actually, that's not um, exactly correct. The reason you do not have a and i cover in these circumstances is because you requested to do something that you're not supposed to be doing. So something that is outside of your legal uh, obligations and actually can um, increase uh, your risk and your legal obligations and also uh, can make you lose your Hague-Visby defenses or limitation rights. 
uh, as with you know any type of insurance, P and I insurance is there to protect you against any accidental or negligent acts or events. It is not there to protect you against your own commercial decisions. In fact, all insurances have exclusion clauses um, for intentional acts of the insured. So uh, these type of circumstances, when you decide to comply with somebody's request which is basically taking you outside of a legal framework and increasing your risks and reducing your defenses was never meant to be covered by insurance. So that puts you in a position where you have um, a risk which is not covered by your insurance or at best it's discretionary, um, but you still want to comply for commercial reasons. So what do you do then? You resort to LOIs because this is the best we have at the moment to, to protect you in that situation. Now, because P&I clubs do uh, commonly assist members even uh, with commercial issues, um, such as the uh, charter party clauses and so on, uh, they also assist members with drafting of LOIs to protect members to the maximum extent possible. This is um, the reasoning behind the IG standard LOI wordings. Basically, for three most common uh, situations, delivery without production of the bill of lading, delivery of the port not indicated in the bill of lading, and both of those at the same time, the IG deemed it's best to draft uh, a strong wording which will protect the members best in this scenario. However, this assistance from the PNI club does not change the fact that the cover is not there. It's not as of right, at, at least. Um, it just is uh, an assistance to, to members. And therefore, it is very important for members to do their due diligence, as Liz mentioned, to make sure that the party signing the LOI is of good financial standing. And we often also recommend that LOI is, um, uh, I mean, that you also get a bank guarantee uh, with the LOI, but I know that this never happens in practice. Um, but uh, I would also like to mention one, which, uh, one thing which I think it's very, very important to realize that there are two types of scenarios in which you might be asked to do something. So um, first one would be uh, to issue a clean bill of lading, for instance, or to date bill of lading incorrectly. So for those types of um, requests, actually they are considered to be fraud in most legal um, systems. And for those, um, you don't even need to bother with an LOI because the LOI will be unenforceable. So uh, it is quite important to differentiate those type of scenarios with sort of the, um, uh, the requests uh, which do not have an in inherently malicious um, sort of background and they're not meant to defraud anyone, like for instance, delivery without production of the bill of lading. Here, the intention is to speed up things and, but you still want to actually deliver to the correct party. So in that case, provided that you make sure uh, the, the party signing the LOI is financially strong, you can actually, if something goes wrong and you're faced with claims, go to the court and enforce such LOI. So I think it's very important when you get a request from a chartered shipper or whoever to first think about this request and think in which category it would fall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. That was a great insight uh, from your side uh, and, and the perspective of the PNI Club uh, in this issue. Uh, and uh, as we move forward, definitely we'll touch upon uh, many other subjects and many other topics uh, during our discussion. And moving across to uh, uh, the owners and operator, uh, uh, Kapil Jao, uh, what's your view and understanding uh, about these issues related to the BLs and LOI? Hello, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the invite me to join this uh, very interesting uh, webinar. And uh, yes, BL lighting LIs, I think is a very, uh, uh, very common, but also with, in the meantime, very important day-to-day uh, -day, uh, tasks handling by the, uh, I think, the ship owners operations department. So we all understand uh, this, for the trade is a B 
designed has to be for this type of system for quite many times. But uh, from owner's point of view, we also see uh, many challenges around these uh, issues. So I think what I want to highlight here is that uh, I think uh, uh, the, the staff, including the shore staff, including uh, the ship staff, clearly understanding these uh, risks, understanding that these uh, proper procedures, uh, plus need uh, some extra knowledge to understand the cargo is sometimes important. So for example, as uh, the, uh, the, the one of the panelists uh, shared, so like uh, the uh, accept, accepting the defective cargo to put a remark or not. But sometimes in the real world, actually master is found out sometimes in difficult to judge this cargo is, is okay or not okay. If to be prudent, we of course must try to put some remarks, but in the meantime, the ship or charter will argue that that cargo is, is, is in a condition. So this also is a, this type of challenge is also we are facing. So sometimes I, I what I want to highlight is people's knowledge. So sometimes we also maybe need to engage some expert, a cargo expert, to keep the opinions before uh, make uh, this type of uh, uh, decisions. So yes, I'm very much. Uh, it is uh, actually during the uh, real practice, uh, even for the LOIs for cargo delivery without the production or bill ladings. Uh, change a port. I think these are uh, wordings are all recommended by the PNI and has been used for many years. And uh, we feel it is a still is very risk. Sometimes if something goes wrong, is we feel owners quite innocent, quite uh, beyond owners' control uh, due to so many chains, so many parties was involved. Actually, it's not the every steps is able to control by the carriers. So again, even for this very common that the LOIs, I think we, our recommendation to the peoples in the owners uh, operation that we need to be very carefully to handle. Of course, for this uh, LOIs, charter to push the LOIs to exchange for clean bill lighting, definitely, definitely we need a much more uh, risk uh, analysis is this again is a uh, very much required that the people's knowledge people's training so i stop here i will uh, look uh, look forward to the discussions this interesting topic including this uh, practical issues with uh, all the panelists thank you kevin uh, thank you kevin, very much thank you. And yeah. indeed it's a it's a it's a it's a great comments from your side uh, being from the perspective of a uh, user uh, or the carrier uh, moving on with uh, Captain uh, NR, uh, uh, he's also with uh, one of the leading owners and operators in Hong Kong. Uh, what's your view on this topic, uh, Captain NR? Yeah, thank you, Sanjeev, and uh, uh, good evening to the panelists and everyone. Uh, it's a great topic that uh, we have selected, and uh, I'm looking forward to enlivening discussion on this topic. So like what Elizabeth had mentioned, um, okay, BL has got its role. LOI is, it's, 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 um, it's uh, it uh, works on two territories. One is commercial, another is legal. Most of the time, the LOI is a commercial uh, necessity, so to say. So if, if the BL is received there at the discharge port properly, the BL is presented, so then there is no need for an LOI. What started uh, as a very simple use of an indemnity uh, today, uh, I could, if I, I could just think of the kind of uh, uh, reasons for which LOIs are issued. One is, of course, there is no OBL at the discharge port. There is change in discharge port, and then there's a combination of the two, which uh, the the IG clubs have got standard wordings. But then, other than that, you know, the 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 uh, the, uh, the initial few paragraphs, the remaining seven paragraphs are retained for every other LOI. So, or rather most of them, there'll be change in shipper details between MR and BL. There'll be request for issuance of clean BL uh, for some cargoes such as bulk cargoes. Uh, then uh, there could be difference in uh, cargo quantity. So the MR could be clause, so they may issue LOI, please don't clause it on the BL because actually there is a difference. We accept there is a difference. And then they want it to be on the shore scale, for example. Whereas the charter party would say it will be on the base of draft survey. Then there will be, um, sometimes there will be issue of the BL itself at the discharge port, say for example, switching BL or splitting BL. 
then change in cargo description by adding a further word at the end it will be a some cargo at the end they would like to add a term called feed stock so uh, so they would like to uh, define like i have seen cases where uh, the charter party defines a particular cargo vessel goes for that loading that cargo nor is standard that vessel can load that cargo and then on the base of the lc requirement they come back with a request saying that the cargo on the bl on the mr will be something different um so then again uh, in all these cases it's basically the pnd club who's the first resort uh, the correspondent the local correspondent on the club with whom we are entered to um, then there could be uh, loading and discharging in light rain uh, then consolidating two mrs into one bl splitting one mr into two bls so there is no limit to uh, to what lois are issued these days so like i said this has become more a commercial requirement as long as things go well there is no problem but when things don't go uh, as planned or as expected then it becomes a legal issue and like what elizabeth said the key aspect is uh, the credit worthiness of the party who is issuing the loi so um, and again uh, though we do hear of the dangers of uh, the loi we seldom come across cases means work gets on uh, we do hear cases of Uh, uh wrong mis delivery of cargo but then ultimately it is resolved uh, of the chain and then uh for the owner and the master they really aren't aware of the chain and what kind of transactions happen who issues who is requesting the loi where from the the request starts it's not known so the only face which the owner has generally in these matters is the charter with whom he is fixed if he has done due diligence with the charter to begin with uh, before fixing a lot of the issues which come with the loi are pretty common uh, the credit worthiness of the charter whether they are good enough so uh, so issues are plenty but then at the same time uh, what is needed is uh, good awareness of the the issues with this and uh, how to react or how to respond to as and when a issue arises so look forward to a, a great discussion wonderful captain and i think it's a very uh, clear uh, uh, you know discussion uh, about the issues which you uh, which you face as an owner and operator and uh, let me start uh, with with uh, some of the uh, some of the discussions uh, and I, i would like to start with you itself uh, 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 that uh, in the real world actually uh, when you are you know handling uh, heading the owners uh, sublet the vessels to, uh, under the char- uh, time charter party to subsequent uh, number of white charter parties and uh, by the time it end up to the real world charter parties uh, which governs the bl uh, how do we decide the trail of relevant charter party in corporation uh, is it fully understood by the masters and the operators and uh, what are what, what is the meaning of the relevant charter party is it easy to identify this trail uh, going forward if there are uh, multiple parties and multiple subnets are involved yeah so usually the charter party either gets marked as freight payable as per, so the bl gets marked with freight payable as per charter party or freight prepaid uh, so it would naturally refer to the charter party which is relevant to the bl form being used now which is the relevant charter party the owner basically uh, the the reason why we are mentioning the charter party is that on the conditions of carriage in the back side of the bl the law on arbitration uh, clause in the charter party is also incorporated into the bl now uh, a lot of time has gone into uh, preparing the charter party clause basically on the law on arbitration a lot of uh, time would have gone into assessing uh, which is the best law and which is the best arbitration uh, jurisdiction um, so uh, now what has happened is that if the owner would like that charter party date to be mentioned here because then it draws reference to the clauses which he is aware of but in practice it is impossible because there will be a chain and uh, it is impossible for the master for the, to know the full charter party chain and the dates when these charter parties were done uh, rather there could also be some commercial sensitivity around that so the master also in the nips 1946 says that master signs the bill uh, bill of lading as presented and then owners have an indemnity from the time charter for doing so but then again we saw about it that uh, the indemnity is basically as long as credit worthy as the time charter so owner on one hand would like to put his charter party date on the other hand the most relevant in this in the chain would be the one which is entered by the y charter which uh, he typically may be the shipper or the uh, uh, receiver so if the y charter is the one uh, he would like to put his charter party there in case there are have been no issues you know in the chain then uh, then uh, you know things go smooth 
but if suppose there is an issue then what the owner has to do is that he has to go back to the time charter and say that you know there is a claimant who is asking for uh, who's claiming and then the issue with that the claimant is going to be on the uh, the the law and arbitration so suppose we go to a jurisdiction which is very different from what originally the the owner had in mind when he was uh, deciding on the the law and the uh, jurisdiction then there is a problem there is a mismatch there is a problem and the uh, the claimant who is the title holder he is going to uh, actually make the claim only against the carrier therefore the owner has to escalate it get the charter party clause and the date and identify where is the uh, the law and the arbitration which is mentioned there but then uh, but then the first thing is if suppose there is going to be a claim which is arising like that the first thing is uh, uh, contact the p and i correspondent the local correspondent to resolve this issue so and then in many cases what happens it is left blank if it is left blank it is good for the carrier i would think it is uh, good for the carrier because even if he insist be ultimately the y charter would like to put his clause there because uh, you know he is the one who is actually entering into the uh, Uh, transaction the snp for the cargo so uh, the owner one way by having the uh, general uh, paramount clauses i think one way he can ensure that he is protected if the owner can get his charter party date included mentioned there on the bl then nothing like it but otherwise if it's uh, blank i would think that uh, it is it's it's not bad yeah that's that's a great comment sir karna and uh, i think uh, uh, what you really saying is is uh, is a real practical things which uh, which uh, most of the owners or the carriers should be doing it um to move on uh, with captain jao um captain jao uh, practically uh, to satisfy the documentary requirement of the letter of credit uh, normally a clean bill is one of the must thing like you know and if the cp often incorporates also that if any bad or damaged car- cargo are there if the master uh, is is a uh, fully uh, responsible and he has authority to unload and was discovered uh, he can unload the cargo like you know he is fully authorized to do that but however in the real world it doesn't happen you know the owners uh, uh, or the cp which requires the bls to be strictly in conformity with the mits receipt but sometimes it just uh, just not practical to be 100% same as mrs like you know uh, like you know as as captain uh, nr mentioned that uh, irrelevant wordings uh, punctuations hyphen space and whatever that one you know Uh, as a master uh, uh, who is on 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 the spot uh, how do they deal with such situation and uh, what all the like you know practical uh, uh, solutions are available to them to deal with such situation thank you the thank you actually good question I, and uh, this uh, is uh, actually in fact there is a, a challenge uh, task for the for the master uh, number one Yes, I think uh, for this uh, the trading system to works. Uh, I think uh, no uh, the bank, no uh, ship would accept a, a non-clean bill. I think a cross bill is impossible. So, but in the meantime, the, the carrier uh, must on behalf of carrier he need to protect uh, carrier owner's uh, interest. He will try to 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 argue these cargo conditions if there is a sus- uh, such a suspicions. So in the real world, I think. Uh, It depend on cargo nature, and uh, from our own uh, experience point of view, like uh, for the when loading the steel cargos, if we must find a, a very apparent damages, I think most time that that because of one coin by one coin, and uh, we are able to replace it. We request the ship to replace it. Don't accept this one, and uh, I think most time we we. We are able to get it done. In the meantime, of course, for the steel car, for our own practices, because uh, again, it's a very much a, a the knowledge regarding this cargo, cargo and the nature, what the purpose for the cargo is hot low or cold low, and all different uh, nature of cargo have the different uh, requirement, and uh, will be have the sensitivity. Cargo damage sensitivity is uh, uh, is is different. So we also engage uh, uh, the. Through the PNI club, engage some uh, expert to to supervise that uh, loading help must because this is the number one cargo value is quite high for the bulk carriers. Number two, and uh, is a 
uh, is a uh, quite need a quite knowledgeable. We cannot expect the every mask to un understand all the cargo edges. So yeah, for this type of cargo, usually we 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 are able most cases we are able to uh, manage this uh, change of the cargo. Or if some stands, we are able to remark on the mess receipt. This is actually a, another interesting uh, interesting the, the the topic. We are able to mark the the mess uh, mess receipts. And the uh, master will give uh, authorization to the agent every time is mentioned very clearly. The peer writing uh, will, of, will be authorized uh, the agent to sign, but in strictly conformity with the, the, the message receipts. But the inner reality, I think uh, agent will still issue another set of peer writing for clean. I, I, I just assume uh, we did not see it, but uh, it's, it is very interesting, actually, that the, the, the uh, reality in the world is a running system. So far, it seems it's not a, not much trouble. So far, based on our experiences, we have put a remark on the message received. We also afford the agent to issue the BID only in conformity with message received. But actually, in the reality, what the agent is, is doing it is a shipper's agent, it is charter agent. Actually, we don't know. So this, I also looking for this topic, I'm looking for the other uh, panelists to share and what it actually is going on. So yeah, uh, come back to the same question to you, but for the, some other type of cargoes, like uh, uh, then we maybe not that straightforward. We are able to, 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 to challenge uh, each other to, to replace. Number one, because it's a parcel cargo is such a big, it's difficult to, to change. Number two, each other sometimes argue, this is you know, acceptable, it, it is okay, but the master suspect not okay. So if there is such a type of the, uh, uh, the, the, the challenges, the, the, the argument, we usually will through the PNI club to appoint some cargo expect to do some some survey to sort because uh, accepting a, a, a clean beer adding and uh, without the closing it is really the risk is too much too much for owners so usually we will not accept so we will try uh, if of course if the cargo after cargo expert uh, inspecting there's a during this cargo natural cargo name and fit is okay within the acceptable range, then we will take the advice from the, uh, the, the, the cargo expert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamjao. I think you put down some of the very interesting and practical things uh, in your, in your uh, uh, reply. And I think one of the very interesting thing is the charter agent, actually the agent who is supposed to be signing bill of lading, he is being, uh, most of the time is a charter agent. So that's a very practical problem. And uh, uh, it's, it's the sometimes you can end up into a real trouble uh, uh, without knowing that uh, what exactly a clean set of bill of lading has been already issued without your knowledge. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Kamjao. So moving on, uh, um, the, uh, Maria, uh, with the original bill of lading, uh, like you know, frequently, uh, uh, even though it's been issued, but uh, uh, it might end up in the cargo owner's hand uh, a long time after the vessel has ready to discharge the cargo. In there could be subsequent uh, uh, quite a long, uh, large gap between the time it's been issued and time it's been uh, arrived in the hands of cargo owners. Uh, this is because that uh, those uh, OBLs are often a negotiable uh, document of type bill, so passes through various payment channels and series of sell and financing arrangement. So, is there any exception to the carriers for misdelivery claims as per the standard exception clause found in the BL? Uh, stating that the carrier is not responsible for any loss or damage to the goods whatsoever uh, cost. While most LOIs are now issued in a standard format recommended by PNI clubs, are the misdelivery claims conclusive within the PNI coverage or is it discri uh, discriminatory? Maria. Um, okay. Um... I mean, as I understand, uh, the, the question basically deals with whether um, owners can use any Hague Visby defenses like um, the catch-all article for um, uh, defense, um, any other uh, reason without uh, any other cause without actual fault or privity of the carrier and so on for, for misdelivery claims and to what extent the IG um, draft wordings of allies protect the carrier against the actual misdelivery claims. 
So unfortunately, um, this is not the defense and it cannot be used because um, the hague Grisby defense requires that there's no actual fault of privity of the carrier in order to use that defense. And the, as, as I sort of mentioned in the introductory uh, part, uh, these are all intentional and conscious decisions that the carrier is making. So delivering without the presentation of the bill of lading cannot be said to be without carrier's privity. He was perfectly aware of what he was doing. Um, and actually the, the fact that he accepted LOI for, for this uh, proves that he knew what he was doing in effect. Um, so, um, and then there's also a question whether um, delivering without production of the bill of lading is actually a complete deviation from the contract in, in the first place and whether the hague Visby rules apply at all, any of the Hague rules defenses. And I mean, this is why these requests are very tricky because the extent of your loss of defenses might be actually um, larger than you think. Um, but um, as to um, uh, to what extent the IG wordings protect um, owners from claims is basically um, to, to no extent, uh, because the LOIs only come in place as an indemnity. So they are in no way a defense against the underlying claim. So you will have to settle the underlying claim and you will have no defenses because it was your conscious intentional decision to do this. And then you will under the LOI look to indemnify or recover uh, any amounts paid from the party issuing the LOI. Now uh, the IG wordings make the LOI as sort of uh, strong as possible uh, with like the, the least room possible for the party issuing the LOI to escape its liability to indemnify you. But it still has nothing to do with the original claim and it still does not provide any defenses for actual misdelivery claim. So this is the difference here. Yeah, thanks Maria. I think that's a, 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 a really great uh, that uh, to understand that the LOIs are not the defense against any misdelivery claims or any sort of claims. It is just providing you an indemnity at the end when you go back to your IG clubs and uh, uh, present those claims. But at the end of uh, the beginning, it's a, it's a carrier or the owners who has to go against uh, those claims uh, uh, upfront with the with the with the the guys uh, who's been claiming against them. So that's a, that's a great point actually you raised regarding the LOI. Um, uh, Liz, uh, like, you know, when we're not, now we're talking about the LOI, so what LOI sprints uh, uh, do you see in the recent time in different uh, shipping sectors, especially the, the bulkers and the liners? Uh, we have heard that the claims by the banks against the carriers are on the rise. And what differences the ship owners can run into these claims by the bank? And, where does the loss ultimately lies, uh, Liz? Um, the, really, the claims that Marie has just been describing, the misdelivery claims, it really is. There's been a huge increase, um, certainly in the number of those been seeing misdelivery claims where cargoes have been filled lading. Um, now, the, the claims that we're seeing are different perhaps from the claims that we were seeing five years or so ago because these ones are insolvency related, generally speaking, and um, they've been brought. So what the issue with these types of claims is that in a way they don't, they're, they're not the ship owner's fault at all. That there's nothing that the ship owner has done to cause, um, you know, a, a, a misdelivery claim being brought by a, a, a trade finance bank usually. Um, but what has happened is just in the usual course, the ship owners delivered the, the cargo without production of the OBLs against an LOI uh, given to someone in its charter party chain. Um, and the someone in the chain has gone insolvent at, at, at some point in time. Uh, you know, it may be after the cargo has been delivered. In fact, it might be before the cargo has been delivered. And it may not necessarily be the might be, you know, someone down the chain. 
Um, but of course, the way that these these um, claims are fi- these cargoes are financed is that the OBLs are deposited with with banks. It's different banks in the chain at different points at, uh, and time in in order that buyers um, and you know can obtain finance to pay for their cargo. So. Um, when the OBLs um, are provided to the trade finance bank as security for the loans to purchase the cargo, um, the bank obtains possession sets of bills of lading. And, and that's, you know, a really important point when we're looking at a misdelivery claim. And, and as everyone on the webinar will know already, a bill of lading is a, is a document of title. So in banks have possession of that bill of lading, Oftentimes, although there are some defences, um, COGSA 1992, the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act, um, under English law, and there are and Singapore law as well, provides that the bank obtains. So when the bank's customer um, goes insolvent and doesn't pay, the trade finance bank holds the original bill of lading. And, it, and, and that was its security um, because it sees, you know, in the bank's hand, it, the, the bank sees that as security in the goods to the full value of the cargo. So, so when the bank makes a loss there, they will look around and see what types of claims they have. Now, in circumstances where that cargo has been delivered against an LOI and, and the original bill of lading um, hasn't been produced, then the bank stands in the shoes of, of, of the cargo owner and uh, has, a, has a prima facie claim against the ship owner for misdelivery or conversion of the goods um, because, the, you know, the, the, the goods had to be produced against the original bill of lading. The bill of lading was at the bank um, and, and it was given to someone else. So, so that, that, is a, that is a real problem and it's, it's, it's hugely problematic for the ship owner because it's not something the ship owner would even be aware of. They have no idea that there's been this insolvency event um, and issues in the banking chain, you know, down in the, in the sales chain. Um, now, these are really strongly contested claims because they're, they're very large in quantum. Um, Maria mentioned um, in the answer to the last question that you lose, you have the potential to lose Hague Visby defences um, when you in these types of claims, and and this is one where we we we've seen that the um, you, you could lose your package limitation defence quite easily, um, and then the quantum of the claim will be the full value of the cargo. Now I've seen some um, oil cargoes. Um, misdelivery claims by trade finance banks in, in oil cargoes, which are very large amounts of money. Um, and I guess that's against the background of, you know, potential loss in, in P&I cover as well. So they're, they're very strongly contested and there are a number of defences that are run to them by ship owners. So all is not lost, um, but they, they're, they're difficult claims um, because prima facie, uh, says that, that cargo is, is delivered only against production of the original bill of lading. Um, so the types of defences that ship owners run to these claims um, usually are quite technical. So we look at sort of who the delivery has been to, um, who, who the actual contractual carrier is, you know, whether there was a bare boat charter, whether the, the bank sued the right party. Um, other defences that are often run are looking at whether the bank consented to the delivery against LOI, uh, so whether the bank knew about it um, or acquiesced in, 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 in the delivery or discharge um, or, or whether there's a similar estoppel type argument. Um, sometimes spent bill arguments are run where um, might have been financed after uh, delivery um, but interestingly, COGSA actually has a carve out for that. And there's a really interesting Singapore decision um, called the UAU. Uh, it was a summary judgment decision came out of the Singapore courts a few years ago, which said that um, if there was a pre-existing trade finance arrangement between the bank and its customer, um, that uh, it didn't matter that the, um, the trade was financed after the cargo had been delivered. Not, not delivered. Um, so, you know, hugely, hugely problematic from a, from a ship owner's perspective.
Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. And Liz, would you like to share some tips for uh, uh, for increasing the chance of recovery for ship owners uh, in, in these uh, kind of situations? Yeah, I think they've largely been covered um, already by the other panelists, to be honest. But you know, you you your recovery is under your LOI. Um, so as Maria has pointed out, you know, the the IG group wordings are drafted to to to, to make that you know the, the the best that it possibly can be. Um, but the, those wordings are often amended. So I think be very, very careful about how those wordings are amended. Um, you know, that they can be made wider, they can be made narrower, uh, depending on which side uh, of, the, of the chain you're sitting in and, and whether you're going to need to enforce the LOI or defend it. Um, you know, you can add, you can do things like um, it, try and exclude the contract's rights against third parties act so that other people can't enforce the LOI and sort of piggyback over an insolvent party. Um, you could try and put a time limit, um, a time bar into your LOI. Um, Maria, I'm not sure if that's often done. I've never seen a time bar in an LOI, um, but certainly possible. Um, the, the other one that is often talked about, uh, and there is a wording to have it countersigned by a bank, um, uh, because obviously one of the really big issues of the LOI provider. Now, I have never, ever seen an LOI countersigned by a bank, but I, if someone has, I would be very interested to know. Great, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Maria. Maria, that like yeah. we, we come across that three different kind of LOIs, which is standard with IG clubs, and the second set always says that the one which is countersigned by the bank. Have you have you come across this situation? No, as I said, uh, we always recommend this, but I've never seen it in practice. But uh, I I wanted to touch upon uh, the the issue that Liz raised about uh, the time bar um, that some charters try to include the time bar in the LOI, and this is very very dangerous because um, I have seen an attempt where um, a charter tried to include a clause saying that the LOI is only valid for, uh, for 12 months after delivery of the cargo. Now, um, as you all know, under hague Visby rules, cargo interests have uh, 12 months uh, from delivery of the cargo to make a claim against the carrier. So if they make a claim on the last day, you have absolutely no chance of then resorting to that LOI, irrespective of all other issues. So um, basically, our advice, uh, if, if a member comes to us with, with the LOI uh, drafted by charters, is to uh, delete any time bar clauses at all, because that then gives uh, members six years uh, under English law to pursue recovery. Uh, but if the, the charters insist on a time bar to make it at least two years so that um, the, the owner would have this extra year after, you know, the hague visby time bar uh, to deal with any indemnity claims. So, yeah, I have seen the attempts, um, but, you know, uh, I think uh, members have successfully resisted them so far. Right. So at the end of the day, it's, it's the members of the ship owners actually to decide how much risk they carry and how long it can go forward before accepting the time bar in the LOI. Wait. Uh, 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 so um, moving on, uh, that um, uh, the master uh, will easily remark on the cargo quantity, especially on the dry bulk as the products are very visible to the crew. Um, however, one, one such small remark on the cargo quantity, which must be also mentioned in the BL, can fail the entire cargo sales actually. And as you know, that the cargo can be traded on the basis of bill of lading. So how do we avoid such silly mistake uh, from happening, especially if it is coming from the ships uh, without inadvertently master can make such remark. Uh, and whereas the, uh, in the letter of credit uh, uh, chain, it, it might not be accepted at all. So uh, what, what is the like, you know, precautions uh, uh, ship owners can take uh, uh, so that uh, such silly mistakes don't happen and uh, you know, uh, we, can, we can save the cargo sales? Uh, thank you, thank you for your questions. Actually, and uh, I think it's very actually very difficult for must very successful to to mark something uh, un, unless for some particular cargo as I mentioned like uh, the, the steel cargo. Otherwise, uh, for the rest bar carrier, very rare uh, master to put. Of course, 
again, it's a uh, depend on uh, the, the knowledge, uh, people's knowledge. Again, also now we have a very uh, good uh, communications. And uh, if master suspect something, definitely he will take photos and uh, he will discuss with the officer staffs. And uh, we, all, of course, we cannot guarantee all the officer staff will understand uh, for every cases. So if we need uh, uh, assistance, and uh, we will do not hesitate to, to contact our PR, PNR club, give some advice, because it is a very huge uh, uh, the, the potential uh, risk uh, is uh, is uh, related. So we will, every time we will, uh, uh, handle it uh, very very carefully. Ba basically, uh, the, the in a real world, I think a master will report to the office, make a final decisions, and we give them strong support. If required, we engage uh, uh, expert through the PNI channel to give advice. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Great. So, um, uh, again, follow, uh, following up with the same thing, uh, like, you know, as we always know that uh, the cargo has to be delivered against the OBL. And uh, uh, when the OBL has been presented to the master, then uh, uh, how do the master knows that, like, you know, they are not delivering the cargo against the force OBL because these OBLs are very easy to copy, uh, uh, which, uh, which is not possible for master to uh, detect easily. Uh, what kind of uh, defenses... Uh, uh, the ship owner can have uh, in these cases uh, where, where the cargo is not discharged for the force of OBLs. Thank you. Actually, yes. And uh, from our point of view, what we tell the master, what the master is trained, he, he will check because usually uh, master signed the bill writing is his own signature, his own stamp. He should be uh, able to, to recognize. Of course, we cannot uh, exclude uh, that uh, situation. He must sign the bill writing, but he signed off in a port before arrival. And uh, who is handling cargo for discharge is uh, around a new masters. But uh, in the real world, for from our own point of view, it seems we do not see many challenges that uh, issues. Maybe because uh, uh, for this type of cargo, whenever Charter present uh, this original bill writing, first of all, it's not a uh, much. We have seen it's a uh, it's not very common uh, since we are we are in a, the uh, the the bar carrier bar carriers and uh, the oil tank oil tankers. I think uh, ninety percent ninety percent of cases is a uh, discharging and against the uh, uh, LOI without the presentation of the bill writing. But uh, in some cases, yes, we do receive that the original bill writings and. Uh, I think from us, there's not much he can do. He just very carefully to see this. This is the bill writing, and with the proper uh, master's own stamps there. Uh, if if he has any suspicions, he should uh, he he should report that 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 is the only instruction reminder uh, to the master because uh, again it is a very very serious. But uh, from my own understanding, this type of risk, uh, yes, if this goes wrong could be very huge amount because since the cargo quantity is so big, but uh, given that the, the parcel is so big, I think it's very difficult for the, for some people who want to forge, make some, 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 some uh, criminal here. It's just uh, forge some bill writing to take out the record. It's uh, very difficult, very challenging, very difficult for, 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 for them to do that. So, but on the, uh, on the delivery of the, the cargo against the LOI, actually I also touched. So we only can see this LOI wordings and uh, must just very much rely on the, on the, 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 the officer's instructions. But uh, in reality, he just follow agent, agent uh, arrangement alongside ship to a particular terminal and discharge the cargo to the crew. And after, afterwards, ship will be sold, sold. Then how agent to deliver the cargo to the right to receive the actually again is out of usually owner's control, out of the, our control. Basically again, it's handled hand, 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 hand by the charters. So I fully agree this uh, other panel is uh, shared. This is very much, uh, rely on the, the reputations, how charters, how reliable and uh, these systems. Thank you. Great, yeah, so-, so And Jeff, could I just pick up on that fraud point yes, very yes. 
Yeah. Briefly, I think it's a really good point that's just been made, which is that would you bother to to make a fraudulent bill of lading to to collect a you know what what are you then going to do with the cargo? Yeah. Um, so so I think fraud in bill of lading in bill of ladings, I think is and where I think probably it comes across my desk more frequently is exactly for that reason. If you if you if you were engaged in fraud and bills of lading, you don't go and collect a cargo. But what you do do is you try and get finance for it. So you try and sell it um, at, or, or you try and give it to a bank to obtain a loan. And that's where it starts to pop up um, as a fraudulent bill of lading in fraud claims, perhaps in the banking and sales contract chain, more so than in um, on owner's side on the actual vessels themselves. Yeah, interesting point, uh, Liz. I think uh, thanks for adding on that one. And uh, definitely, I mean, um, as Captain Jao says, that in all, done all in good faith till everything goes well. And um, definitely, uh, uh, one of the solutions uh, moving across is is the e bill of lading, which we'll touch upon uh, down the line in our discussion. But um, uh, going going back to the counterparty risk, uh, uh, which uh, which is uh, uh, related to the issuing issuer of the LOIs. Um, uh, how important is to investigate that counterparty risk? And uh, uh, when uh, when an LOI is issued for uh, um, uh, non-availability of OVL, and given the substantial delay, it can have, uh, occur before the OVL may uh, uh, comes into the hands of the real cargo owner. Um, and all LOI just provides a, a little bit of comfort to the, uh, the party who's receiving this one. But uh, a poor financing health and subsequently a collapse of the, uh, the counterparty can be a real issue. So, uh, Captain NR, would you like to share more about that? Like, you know, what are the factors which you've taken into account uh, uh, when investigating the counterparty risk uh, against uh, issuing against uh, such LOIs? Yeah. Um, to, uh, uh, when uh, issuing a LOI, uh, there are a few things which which has to be uh, you know looked at uh, when receiving an LOI. Uh, typically, in the charter party itself, there are some clauses which agree for uh, accepting uh, you know certain actions to be done on the base of LOI, like uh, you know uh, discharging without OBL is one, switching BL, splitting BL. Sometimes uh, there are some charters which are uh, on established uh, traders, reputed traders, but on uh, particular runs where the cargo has to be, the quantity has to be as per the shore scale. So there also there could be a clause which is agreed in the charter party itself. So, but when we receive an LOI, especially for the, with the case of uh, an, uh, uh, discharging without an OBL. So we need to see whether there is a legitimate reason why the LOI is uh, uh, issued. And then uh, who is the one who is issuing? So like I said, if we have to look at the, uh, whether the issuer is uh, having a good financial standing and in what jurisdiction their assets are located. So typically when a due diligence is done before fixing a charter, these points would be uh, covered there. Uh, and then if the is the recipient of the cargo, the same as the consignee under the bill of lading, uh, then uh, yeah, if, if, if the LOI can be uh, having a wide wording, like uh, the IG club had modified the wording earlier with the case of the Songa wins and Zagora where there was a uh, wrongful delivery. So there were three other conditions which were added uh, like to such a party as you believe to be or represent or to be acting on behalf of the receiver. So uh, these kind of wordings uh, which are broader to pr protect the interests of the uh, carrier. Similarly, if the LOI address to a wide range of parties, that's better than uh, has to ensure that uh, whether what uh, uh, Elizabeth was mentioning about contracts, that is rights of third parties act is included or at least it's not excluded in the LOI. So that will give some kind of a protection that even if the party who issues, issues the LOI uh, is uh, financially bankrupt, uh, on the basis of this, they can actually go because if there is usually a back-to-back -back LOI which is given. So I think it was in the case of the Lamthong Glory where uh, they went uh, with the other party who had issued to the bankrupt party and they were able to successfully get uh, indemnified. So that could be another way. And then uh, ensure that the LOI is not having any validity what uh, Elizabeth was mentioning. Ensure deliveries to the party who's named in the LOI or their agent. Obtain evidence confirming the identity and capacity of who's taking delivery. 
and uh, have a good paper trail on all this ideally do not release the cargo unless the obl but then that's an ideal situation now again a uh, few things which has to be uh, can taken care of is that uh, can the owner rely on this contracts act and suppose if the owner like uh, typically if it is a single trip charter can the owner uh, go for an anti suit injunction to prevent claim by a third party in foreign jurisdiction uh, that is contrary to law and jurisdiction of the bill of lading so uh, these are basically uh, areas which can be explored and of course these have to be work very closely with the paint deck club uh, and the lawyers to see how the owner's interest can be protected yeah interesting captain and uh, i think uh, uh, you touch upon most of the things and um, um, as we are running uh, close uh, uh, to this thing i'll just take one more question to all of you and probably uh, uh, request your uh, your comments on this particular things uh, especially when you touch upon the fraudulence of the bill of lading and uh, probably the uh, you know the technology can help us over there and in the line of trade uh, Uh, we always uh, we already have seen the trade has been decentralized uh, the use of electronic bill of lading blockchain smart contracts uh, are getting more and more popular in the line of trade um, how useful are these are in dry bulk or the tanker trade and uh, uh, if if we do the business in a very standardized way as we do in the line of trade uh, when the contract changes hand multiple times and commissions are earned on the every sublet uh, so Uh, what's your view on that one should the industry move into that direction where everything is technology backed up and based so that the, these fraudulent activities can be minimized and at the same time uh, it is more trustworthy to know that who with whom you are doing business with so let me start with maria uh, what's your comment on that maria um thanks sanjeev <laughs> i'm not quite sure how much i can add to this um topic since actually pndi clubs are not sort of directly using this technology so um the extent of our involvement is um whether or not actually extend cover if our members are using this technology um so to uh that extent um pni clubs ig pni clubs have since 2010 uh ag- approved basically use of five uh electronic bill of lading systems three of those are on blockchain technology um this means that normal pni risks um arising um under those electronic uh documents will be covered as normal but it also means that usual exclusions will apply so if you discharge the cargo in a different port and said on the bill of lading electronic or not the cover will not be there as of right um and but also then we uh, never cover additional risks which are inherent to the use of this digital technology so if the system is hacked and somebody you know gains access to this bill of lading uh, by that way that will not be a pni risk that's a cyber risk and a, a different different area so basically even for the approved systems for electronic trading we only cover uh, the normal pni risks which would arise in a normal uh, trade um and uh, basically i would invite actually um perhaps captain joe or captain nr uh to to provide i mean if they have experience with these systems to provide some comments because we actually invite our members experience and comments so that we can learn about this as i say we don't use it directly Uh, interesting maria but uh, one thing before i move on to uh, 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 other panelists uh, is very interestingly you say that the risk of cyber uh, cyber risk over here and if something happens because of the cyber uh, uh, risk or uh, the things being hacked by the uh, the professional hackers or uh, they they some uh, kind of uh, uh, issues are happening because of these uh, electronic uh, technological things and that thing is not covered by pni no. uh, am i correct no because that that is additional uh, risk which was never part of uh pnd cover in the f- first place so, and also it is not a u- uh, mutual risk as you know pnd clubs are mutual so we have to make sure that all um members are uh, taking similar um level of risk and this is why also we uh insist that nobody contracts on terms more onerous than hate visby rules for instance 
because we want to make everyone, you know, at the same level. And uh, so that uh, none of the ship owners will be, you know, paying extra contributing to somebody else's claims. So, um, you know, at the moment, uh, paperless trading is not so widely accepted uh, that this would make it even close to mutual risk. So it is not even in contemplation of the clubs at the moment to extend cover for risk specific to electronic trading like cyber. Great. Uh, and before I move on to uh, our two ship owners in the panel, uh, Liz, uh, uh, from legal perspective, what's your, what's your comment on that one, uh, having heard what p and Club says? Um, for, from a me, we would see a lot less claims as we, as we move towards electronic systems. And I think the reason, um, you know, human error creates, creates claims uh, and shipping is at the moment largely a paper-based business. Um, and, and where we see shipping documents produced with paper, you know, th there is room for fraud and, and room for the, the natural um, expectation would be that you would see less claims because there's less opportunity for things to go wrong when they're automated in that way. Great. Uh, can't disagree with that one uh, because definitely we can avoid all the human errors. So, uh, Kevin Jao, having heard uh, uh, Maria and Liz, uh, what's your comment on that from the use of technology to reduce all the human errors which we were talking earlier? Thank you, Sanjeev. Yes, I, actually, I agree uh, that uh, these uh, technologies uh, make uh, uh, remove the certain risks, make the errors uh, uh, less. And uh, we, as uh, owners, we like the systems. We are in reality, we are also using some uh, bio ladings or uh, electronic bio ladings. I think one of the uh, service provider, I think if I remember correctly, the e docs. Basically, of course, I'm not a, a real the operator for operating this system, but I heard uh, from my sharing from my team member, they are, they are, they are, they are like it. The basically, with this, the electronic bio ladding systems is. Uh, office staff have the more control over the other process instead of the hundred before like a like the other is very much relying masters so basically this is make the more comfort so when when they approve when sign be already basically we also everything we go through the offices review and the uh, staff they approve then then the be already will issued in terms of the come to the cargo delivery i think so far with electronic, uh, electronic bio ladings, every every case is uh, they were surrounding the uh, original bio lighting before discharging. So for for this point, uh, from basis of, from my team and from my own understand, yes, this is to make the uh, risk less and make error less. In those uh, in terms of the, the Maria uh, that the mentioned the sub risks, actually I, I'm not uh, I cannot guarantee it's correct. Uh, 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 because I needed to go for the, I think the service provider will protect. Uh, they will buy some insurance cover to protect cyber risks. If some 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 cover is there. It's not totally exposed exposure to the uh, cyber risk part. And uh, for the standard piano cover, we already have the, the circular from piano side. We all have, but cyber uh, security part, uh, cyber uh, security. Uh, this uh, I think service provider will take care. If I'm remember correctly, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Captain Joe. And I think just to add on, probably the use of blockchain can further enhance the security in, in terms of the cyber risk, uh, because if you just use the electronic bill of lading as a paper, it can be definitely a lot of loopholes there. But if you incorporate the blockchain, it can be further enhanced. Um, Captain Anna, uh, what's your comment on that one um, um, after listening to all the fellow panelists? Yeah, we, we have used uh, uh, a couple of them. So more popular for in-house shipments, companies which are part of the same group, like, uh, you know, major trading houses, green trading houses. What uh, uh, I understand from the broking network is 30% of the Cape cargoes move using electronic PLs these days. And shipments which are, uh, you know, not to order, uh, they are there, uh, they use this. Oil trade also, other than the smaller ones, the smaller parties would not be in a position to use. They are more reliable on paper. But uh, from the owner's perspective, other than the cyber fraud, which uh, uh, Maria had mentioned, uh, otherwise, I think owner's interests are well protected uh, using the electronic BL. Uh, all the issues that we would face because of the LOIs, that would not be there 
uh, because it's actually the OBL which is uh, presented for discharge. Great, thanks, thanks, Captain Nanar. And uh, as we are approaching towards the end of webinar, and uh, uh, I don't have much time to take uh, much of the questions. So it was very interesting and intense. But uh, I would still like to take one question, which sounds to me quite interesting, uh, and I, I ask the panelists to comment on that one. Uh, there's a question that we have noticed in some random cases that after completion of the voyage, a bill of lading verification is being requested by ICC, International Maritime Bureau, IMB would appreciate feedback if the vessel owners are mobilized or should share the information with such entities like IMB. Can you just comment on that one? I have personally seen that uh, IMB has asking for verification of BL after the cargo has been discharged. Uh, quite often I have seen on a wet trade on the tanker side, this is very common. Uh, I can tell you why. Um... As to whether they should or not, I guess that 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 depends who who one is advising. <laughs> um, they 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 usually come out of um, fraud claims. That that that's generally why the, why the requests are made, um, because there is really no way of establishing if you're a third party and and you have the um, the what you think is the original bill of lading, other than getting in contact with the owner or the agent at the load port, it's very, very difficult to um, verify whether 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 the bill of lading is real or not. And, you know, you can write to the owners and they can ignore you um, or they can respond. And so I guess this is the mechanism that we have at present um, for attempting to ascertain whether that cargo, you know, did, was carried on. The questions are pretty standard in this, what uh, Elizabeth is mentioning, whether this cargo was loaded and this port and this was the vessel name. There are very, very few questions which are asked. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, are uh, are I, Sorry, I can't Yeah, please. Yes, I share the, uh, uh, the, the, the point with the captain, uh, right? So basically, from my point of view, I don't bother to uh, to give the answer. Just telling these factors: uh, cargo where cargo loaded, what type of cargo has been loaded, and uh, which part of this uh, this facts uh, figures uh, is uh, listed in the bill headings. Interesting, okay. actually. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, what I my take is basically that it's not a must for the owners to reply to such email. Uh, uh, mostly, it comes through the email and. Uh, uh, they can take their call whether to respond to that thing. And very interestingly, uh, most of the cases where I have seen such kind of mail from IMB, uh, it is uh, related to the uh, the oil major companies. I have seen a couple of big names over there and, and the IMB comes back to verify the bill of lading details uh, from the owners uh, in, in this thing. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, we are just on time and um, uh, I, I couldn't take uh, most of the questions from the audience, but uh, rest assured that we'll get back to you with the replies to your questions uh, through the email. And again, I, I take this opportunity to thank all the speakers uh, for your efforts in preparing for this webinar, especially today was a Typhoon Signal 8 uh, for most of the day in Hong Kong, and we all have been joining this webinar from our home. Uh, home. So uh, thanks very much, our, our, our speakers, for your efforts and our participants. Uh, it was a great uh, having you all. And over to you, Jagmeet San. See, the thing is, um, Sanjeev, you can thank the panelists, you can thank the participants, but there has to be someone to thank you, right? So that is why I stayed back to you. Thank you so much for very good uh, moderating the entire panel so well. And of course, Liz, thank you. Captain Narsiman, uh, everybody has been telling you NR, NR. So I would like almost 200 people to know your name is Captain Narsiman. Of thank course, you. they know you. Captain Zo, thank you so much. Maria, fantastic. And uh, I have put on the chat box of our next webinar, which is uh, ICSHK webinar on general average on the 8th of uh, December. So look forward to your support to all of our participants. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, have a very good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.